Welcome, everyone, to episode 15 of the Full Dash Closure audiobook and podcast. My name is Jeff Thomas Black. I'm your host and the guy working on the, the podcast and the book and all those things. And today I have with me a, uh, a new friend. We, we, Sergio and I first talked, I think, at the end of last year. And I followed his work closely, I've been on his program, the rideshare guy that he's on uh, with a number of other contributors. And Sergio has been making some some news lately, not only in California, but nationwide and, and internationally, because uh, Sergio's work is focused upon the gig economy. And to kind of give my introduction of Sergio before he gives he gives his own. Uh, I see Sergio and his show, The Rideshare Guy. They're kind of a, they're kind of, I would say, the, the business standard for analysis of the gig economy, for a true understanding of what's going on in the industry. Uh, I think in general, each of them has their biases, but I really appreciate the fact that they they take really everything at face value. There's no, there's nothing that is that is sacred. Um, they're looking at, at, I think, first and foremost, their audience is a workforce of people that has long been abused, overworked, and underpaid. And and that's uh, that happens to be the, the audience that I um, write for, if not always to, as well. And so uh, we really clicked, and I love his work. I like what these guys do uh, because they're, they're realistic, as am I, in this very difficult world. The gig economy is here today and we have to deal with it. Is it the way that it should be? Is it fair? Is it even legal? No, those are questions that are left to be settled as time goes on because this is all very new. But uh, it is here today. There are people involved in it today. And because of that, we have to deal with things as they are. And, and I think Sergio's contribution, uh, as well as those the rest of the folks on, on the Rideshare Guy channel, their contribution is to really take a look at the industry as it is with without rolls colored glasses without any really end goal in in mind other than to distribute i think fairly the information so i appreciate your work sergio please uh introduce yourself and also i guess uh even though i would have had you on the podcast anyway you happen to be um enjoying a moment of, of a bit of fame, I think nationally and internationally, because you and another gentleman challenged uh, the state of California to live up to uh, legislation that was passed. And uh, I'm going to let you take the story from there. So thank you so much for coming to the show, Sergio, from the Rideshare Guy, and uh, take it away. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Jeff, for having me on. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, as Jeff said, I'm, I have been the senior contributor for the Rideshare Guy for the last five years, uh, mainly on the website, um, writing articles, experience, basically, because I am a gig worker. Um, I have, I think, eight or nine apps now on my phone. Um, and I always say, my, you know, my time is for sale to the highest bidder. Uh, to me, the important thing is I'm going to make the most amount of money um, in the shortest period of time. But that's not the issue why we're here for today. So um, writing, you know, articles is one thing, right? And then what happened is that about a year ago, as you guys can see, I'm also host of the Show Me The Money Club on the Rideshare Guys YouTube channel, which has become quite popular. Um, and you know, we're growing our community every day. Um, so people are gravitating towards it because we call it the way we see it. You know, we don't sugarcoat things. We inform and educate. And that's the difference between our channel and many, many, many others um, in, in the YouTube planet. Um, what we try to do is, you know, we're more analytical. We, we try to break things down. We try to um, make sure drivers are... Uh, if they're using the gig apps towards their plan B or on a full-time basis or part-time basis, we make sure that they're efficient. They're a lot more efficient because um, if you're out there for 40 hours a week and if you can make an extra five bucks an hour or th even three bucks an hour, incremental improvement, you know, over a year-long period, 
that's going to amount to a lot more money in your pocket for doing the exact same thing. So, you know, I think our success is based on having a balance. Um, is the gig economy all bad? Uh, our opinion, no. Is it all good? Absolutely not. Are there things to be changed? Absolutely. But within that, we have laws and regulations that um, a lot of these companies, gig companies such as Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, have to abide by. And um, some of it is written by themselves, such as uh, a proposition called 22. And what happens is that um, we read everything, right? We, we make sure every you know, T is crossed and every I is dotted. And we hold these companies' feet to the fire. Um, as Jeff correctly stated, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I am also doing pretty much every single uh, media interview that the rideshare guy puts out there. Um, so I've been quoted in, you know, hundreds of publications in the past few years, but um, this one was a pretty big one. And it came to me with a simple text by another driver in California. And with his nudging, you know, look where we are. The rest of his, the rest is history, as they say. It is, Jeff, it is really um, an advantage to have a megaphone, right? Because our platform is the largest platform in the country when it comes to the gig economy. And, um, you know, but even with that, our outreach is really only 150, couple hundred thousand people out of, I don't know, gig workers estimated six, eight million in the country at the moment. And uh, in California, being the largest market, you know, according to Pew Research, we figured out that 1.4 million gig workers exist in California. And that's a huge number. Okay. And um, so, you know, that's what we do. I mean, we, we try our best in the background to do a lot of work, uh, which a lot of gig workers, you know, we cannot reach. Obviously, I wish I, I wish I had a. I could push a button and reach all 1.4 million at the same time in California. Yeah, I want I want to I want to talk about that as well. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of things that about your work uh, because I think we we cover very uh, similar topics, but from I think slightly different angles. Uh, yeah. You actually have have made some transition over the time that I've known you into doing uh, more food delivery. Yeah. And I think part of that was because of Prop 22. Yeah. Is that is that correct? So can you, yeah, can you mean, explain you for, know, for listeners that aren't in California, just a basic nuts and bolts of what yeah. Prop 22 is, why Prop 22 came about, and who was behind Prop 22? Because I think yeah. uh, it would be easy to erroneously assume that prop 22 was some kind of measure for the people that some that prop 22 was some kind of victory for the people and since it was sponsored by the gig economy uh corporate cartel uh that that's out there you can you can just bet that that's not the case so no so i mean you know I, i'm not a huge fan of, the, of prop 22 obviously you know our concern with prop 22 is that um, a lot of these gig companies have clones of this proposition, you know, being floated around in many different states, right? So these other states better know what they're getting and what better way than, you know, figuring it out before they can try to pass these types of propositions all over the country. Um, you know, the, the main reason for Prop 22 coming around was um, in 2019 um, in California, there was a, a law became AB5, which codified pretty much every single gig worker as employees of these company became law of the land. And uh, of course, these companies, you know, when I say these companies, I'm just going to mention them as gig companies and I'll just go through a list and then we'll, that'll be the reference for your viewers. Is obviously Rideshare, right? In Rideshare, we have Uber and Lyft. In last mile delivery, we have uh, DoorDash, The Leader, Uber Eats, Grubhub, um, Instacart, and many smaller ones. Um, and this includes pretty much every company that hires independent contractors for last mile delivery as well, such as Amazon Flex, Walmart Spark, Target Shipped. So these are the big guys, right? 
So what happens is that once they they decided that AB5 was not corporate friendly, and it's not, obviously, because the, the models of these companies from the first day on has been that they cannot afford employees to have employees. They cannot afford to pay for health care. They cannot afford to pay for their expenses, for their cars. And, you know, they came up with this uh, model. It's called a zero asset business model, meaning they don't own anything. You know, I'm, I'm doubtful they even own their own servers. They're probably renting some Amazon AWS servers, right? And um, so they started uh, campaigning hard and around the 2022 election, 2020 national elections, way before then, obviously, and started floating something called Proposition 22, which was going to nullify all the effects of AB5. And... Uh, well, they have the money, and it was the most expensive campaign in the history of the U.S. when it comes to a proposition. Um, between Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, Grubhub, they spent two hundred and twenty million dollars of their own money. Um, and this is in this is not a national campaign. Now, California, no. I believe, is the fourth econ- uh, fourth largest economy. Yeah. Uh, in is that in the world? Yep, it is. California the is the largest economy, economy in the world. I guess where else would it be? But anyway, yeah. the 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 fourth largest economy in the world. So, the fact that uh, this is happening in California is not incidental to anyone, right? No. This becomes no. a this becomes a test case uh, for the planet for for every yeah. for every global economy and every national economy at this point. So the significance yeah. can't be underplayed here of what this is, and the. The business model, as, as Sergio stated, is not a business model that is built for legislation because it's not really a business model at all. I, I, so that's, that's, I guess, my, my question for you as, as we get to this. So then they came back with, with Prop 22, which, which was the gig economy cartel's response, and it was a very, very expensive response to uh, previous legislation that basically I don't think would, would be survivable. I don't think they could have, under their current business model, effectively operated under that, under that previous law. And $220 million indicates to you how uh, intensively they fought this. I also think it's really important to note that their, their chief uh, lobbyist, if you will, worked in the white house yeah well uh, they, is... i mean they have look you know to make that connection obviously um it, you know we can point that out i mean i i'm I, I don't think you know i i'm here to talk about that but uh, the existing um chief legal officer at uber tony west is the brother-in-law of kamala harris our current vice president um, I mean, those things, you know, I, I, we can talk about that later if you like, but well, I don't so think I think that the, 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 the point, issue. the point I was going at with the lobbyists isn't, isn't that they're, these are, these are people that have powerful contacts. It's the fact that these are, these are the people in power, yeah. right? It, it literally in power. And so when prop 22 went through, um, it didn't necessarily, deliver to well there's two stages of not delivering it didn't necessarily deliver the benefits overall to the workers and then you discovered a second portion of it that was undelivered can you talk about both of those yeah sure so so prop 22 you know with the backing of 220 million and unending uh literally like i was watching (laughs) prop 22 commercials you know, for six months before the November elections in 2020. That's just everywhere, right? And, and you know, we have to also consider who they're up against, right? They're bun- against a bunch of unions um, um, like the SEIUs, RDUs, which is, you know, Right Share Drivers United and, and you know, local groups that didn't have the money, obviously, to, to uh, fight this, right? And, and uh, you know, in today's age, as we know, money talks, BS walks. And, um, you know, we know with other elections, uh, senatorial or house elections, how much these people spend money on their campaigns. It's become this, you know, whoever has the biggest, biggest, uh, 
you know, dollars is going to pretty much do whatever they want to do. And um, so long story short, you know, November comes, Prop 22 is at ballot, is on the ballot. And 59% of Californians voted for it. And it became the law of the land, nullifying all the effects of AB5. Now, um, you know, there's a few parts of Prop 22, but the main two parts of Prop 22, the way it's written, First of all, the way Prop 22 is written is um, not to benefit the driver, you know, come to uh, ride share or delivery. Um, the reason for that is, is um, you have to understand what active time means in our lingo, in our planet. Okay. So there are three phases of a delivery or a three phases of a ride share trip. The first phase is called period one, which is you're sitting in your car waiting for a request. Under Prop 22, that's not covered. Um, so basically, if you get one order an hour and it, it takes you 15 minutes to do, the rest 45 minutes, you're sitting. You're just waiting for another request that you're willing to accept. Um, so Prop 22 is written under active time or what these companies call utilized time. Active time starts the clock when you accept a trip as a driver on ride share or food delivery. And that's called period two. And then you go to pick up your passenger on your way to destination. That's called period three with a button in the back seat or food in the car or package. Um, so Prop 20 to only covered the active time, the time that you're actually doing the job. And I've been a ride share driver since 2016 on Uber and Lyft. Prop 22 passed in 2020, January of 2020, it became the law of California. And um, I had never gotten a dime from January 2020 all the way to July of 2023 when I decided to spread my wings and look into some deliveries, doing some deliveries. I had never done a delivery until July 2023. So three years, not a dime out of Prop 22 as a rideshare driver only. So that kind of shows that, number one, I'm a cherry picker, so I don't really take every trip. Um, so what it does is it puts me above the minimum wage thresholds that Prop 22 wrought into the law, which in my case, I'm in L.A., in Los Angeles County, is 120% of minimum wage. Now, that all sounds good because they all go, all oh, 120% must be really good money. Well, in L.A. County, as expensive as L.A. is or California is, minimum wage is $15.20. And uh, 120% of that puts me at $19.20. Um, if I cannot make on active time $19.20 as a rideshare driver, I should not be doing this. I should be going flipping burgers or doing something else. Okay? That's the reason. I did not get any money out of Prop 22 for three, you know, literally for three years until I started doing deliveries. And that's gross income too. That's not, that's not that, income yeah, yeah, after that's expenses. All yeah, that's all gross income. So, you know, and by the way, you know, this is another pet peeve I have or, you know, another argument I have all the time with other so-called content creators, which I don't call myself a content creator. I call myself a researcher, um, <laughs> is that they go, oh, I made a thousand dollars this week. I, I'm going like, no, you did not make anything. Not even close. You grossed a thousand dollars. Now we can talk about what you made if you like with all your deductions and expenses, but that's a different story. So I had not gotten a penny because I always make more than minimum wage, which is 1920, which is really not that much. I mean, I'll give you an example on that. If you're a rideshare driver, you'd accept one single trip per hour. One, okay. And what happens is that, um, let's, and let's just consider a simple example. Um, a 10-mile trip that lasts half an hour. I mean, in LA, traffic is very reasonable. <laughs> so if that 10-mile trip that lasts half an hour paid me, for example, $15, right? Now, that's right at that 15, 20 minimum rate. So 120% is 1920. But what these companies do, because it's on active time, and let's assume that I did not receive another trip, okay, for that for the remaining half hour. I'm just sitting there watching YouTube, whatever I'm doing, waiting for a request. 
what they do is they will take that half hour, extrapolate that to 60 minutes, and make it look like on active time, I made double, which is $30 an hour. Right. Or, right, so on active time, it's almost impossible to hit that threshold. If, as a driver, you're going to make more money, for sure. Right, and this 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 funny math has been the, the mainstay of the gig economy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Started, always right? on active time, because every advertising or every media push or every PR they put out, Ooh, drivers are making $36 an hour. I'm like, uh, no, they're not. <laughs> right. And every every CEO is culpable for that lie. Every gig economy CEO is culpable for that lie. We interviewed all these people on our channel. You can go watch it, people. And yep. and they all unequivocally say that. Oh, 36 bucks an hour, 35 bucks. In fact, we have videos calling them out. And on a subsequent uh, interview, Derek Orshajai, the CEO of Uber, said, well, I know about that video, you know. You know, I know the skepticism, but we're not going to lie about this stuff. Uh, it's not a lie, but it's fuzzy math. <laughs> uh, yeah, know? there's there's lies and there's damn lies, right? This is yeah, are, exactly. So I'm like, lies. math don't lie. So let's not get into that, right? So so long story short, I had never gotten a penny out of Prop 22, right? So Prop 22 has a second phase to it, second part to it, when they wrote the law. Besides this minimum wage shenanigans that they have on active time, right? They included something in there. They called it mileage reimbursement or maintenance fee or maintenance reimbursement. So let's understand that math as well. As of 2023, the IRS standard mileage deduction is 65 and a half cents. Guess what, Jeff? Guess what their number was when they came up with Prop 22's, uh, you know, maintenance or mileage payment? Exactly half, 30 cents. So right then and there, you have to understand, if they're offering you half of the IRS mileage, you know, standard deduction, you're in bad waters. You, you, you that, that mess immediately does not add up, right? But in addition to that minimum wage part, guarantee part they called it minimum wage guarantee i'm like that's not a guarantee minimum wages if i go stand somewhere and don't do anything for an hour i get 15 dollars and 20 cents like mm-hmm. compare yourself to a mcdonald's cashier they don't get paid on active time they're standing right. there they have a customer that they're charging getting taken an order from or not or a McDonald's right. cook, if they're flipping burgers or not, they're getting paid that minimum wage, right? right. That's why this is not a job and this is not employment. This is no, a not. gig no, 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 and no, this no. is these are independent contracts taken by individuals. And if yeah. you want to assert that those individuals are individual contractors, you can do that. I assert that that's relative. No, I, I don't consider myself an independent contractor. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's so-called independent contractor, but I don't. But um Besides that, so the 30 cents a mile um, mileage, you know, uh, expense reimbursement was written into the law on top of that guaranteed minimum wage part. And there are a couple other things in there, which we should mention, to, to be fair. There is a healthcare stipend that if you work certain amount of hours, in, in their case, in all the companies' case, was if you work 20 active hours, meaning active again, Make the you know make the distinction. There is a big difference between online hours and active hours. Right. You could be online with your app on for thirty, but you could only you could only be active maybe for ten. So your utilization rate is like thirty three percent as opposed to being online and getting paid for every online hour. Right. Um, but their their rebuttal to that is that well you could be do, on four different apps at the same time that's why we're only going to consider active time I'm going like um, uh-huh. more fuzzy math in there <laughs> yeah but coming, anyway they get you coming and going on that stuff yeah on that stuff yeah so so long story short again thirty cents a mile was the part of the um, you know um, mileage reimbursement and when we talk about the healthcare stipend by the way it is not that even if I worked. 20 active hours a week. They would give you half of uh, a healthcare stipend, which could run up to $1,250 a month. Okay. Now that would be 625. If I worked 40 active hours, now in order to work 40 active hours, I have to be out there 60 for sure. And that's a 75% utilization rate. That's a lot of hours in the car. Um, So in order to get to 1250, 
Let's say I did the 40 active hours. Now, this is over a quarter's period, you know, right? One week I get sick and I cannot make up this 40 active hours. I'm screwed. Right. I'm not getting my healthcare stipend, okay? So this is 40 weeks after 40, 40 hours active week after week after week after week. Because if I miss one, now next week I have to go 60 active hours to catch up. And there's the there's the fallacy of independent contractor, and there's the fallacy of independence and fallacy of 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 benefits altogether. Is that altogether, keeping yeah. up that pace is just totally inhuman. Yeah, keeping well, up that pace that is inhuman. There, it's expensive. It's but, it, but if, Jeff, it doesn't end there. See, right. see, let's say let's say I did the forty active hours to get the full healthcare stipend, right? Right, and we know guys that do that, right? There are people out there that are just oh, there are people out there that can grinding. just do it, man. They yeah. can there, just there are grind. people out there grinding, and we talked to Uber, Lyft, and all these companies. Obviously, according to their data, only twenty to twenty-five percent of all the gig workers, drivers, are on a full-time basis. Basically, this is their livelihood. Well, that's still a huge number in California. So, if twenty-five percent of one point four million is like three hundred thousand people, that's a lot. But it doesn't end there. So they have the healthcare stipend, right? So they got you with the forty active hour clock going. Now, let's say you got the healthcare stipend. You drove 40 active hours for consecutive 12 weeks in a row. For that quarter, you got your money, right? Well, most drivers, as we know, are not well to do people. Mostly they're on Medi-Cal. They're on state-funded, you know, healthcare programs. Guess what? Medi-Cal is not in there. It has to be a list of their approved healthcare programs. Or if your wife is working and you're driving uh, as, the, as the man of the house, and she has healthcare through her company, that stipend is not going to be given to you because you you have coverage already. It's not like this 1250 a month that you're going to get that you can go buy any healthcare you want, like you can go buy Blue Cross PPO or something like that, right? So there's, so so there's, there's some... many hurdles. There's many hurdles in order for you to get this healthcare. So it's not like this, ooh, huge benefit, but I'm drawing 40 active hours for 12 weeks and now I'm going to get my money. Have it has to be approved by them. Have they verified the amount that they've actually uh, that they've actually subsidized in healthcare? I'm sure they haven't shared that number. They will not. Well, that we, we're going to discuss that hopefully in the remaining uh, you know few minutes or whatever we have. Yeah, that I will explain that part because that's you know uh, for us we we're just at the tip of the iceberg now. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, so that thirty cents uh, thirty cents a mile. Going back to that thirty cents a mile. Um, um, mileage reimbursement they also wrote into prop 22 which, which was clear after we looked into it that they put in there now this was done in january 2020 and pandemic was kicking in right march of 2020 shutdowns were happening um and uh, uber, food delivery and grocery delivery under uber eats doordash grubhub instacart blew up right everybody couldn't go anywhere they were all ordering their food online DoorDash was a dead company in the water. Uber Eats was dead in the water. And then they took off because of the pandemic. Well, when they wrote the law in 2019, I don't think they figured the pandemic was coming around. <laughs> and I think to their mistake, they wrote something in the law called uh, inflation adjustment for this 30 cents a mile um, you know, reimbursement that they were supposed to pay the drivers on top of the so-called minimum wage guarantee. And... Um, for for from 2020 to the end of 2020 and finishing 2021 it was supposed to remain at 30 cents but i don't think any of these companies figured that the effect of the pandemic is going to be that we're going to be in an inflationary spiral in this country and they put in an inflation adjustment into that 30 cents a mile uh, reimbursement they said according to the cpiu whatever the inflation rate is for the year of um 2021 we're going to adjust the 22, 2022 numbers going forward from whatever the CPIU rate was in the country. And another smart thing their lawyers did was they took the can and or ball and threw it into the California Treasurer's Court. California Treasurer is a publicly elected official, okay? And she has been the same person, Fiona Ma, um, for the last, since 2019, actually. Who is running for lieutenant governor in California during this upcoming election? So they said, well, this inflation adjustment will be done 
year by year by year. So 2022 of January comes, there was no inflation adjustment made. I'm like, okay. Um, then 2023 comes. Well, we're all suffering from inflation, as we know. Um, no adjustment was made for that as well. So uh, fast forward to April 13th, 2023. Pablo Gomez, who I give full credit for this, um, brought this to my attention with a simple text. And, you know, if anybody wants to see all the evidence, all the screenshots in chronological order, it's on our website. Go visit it. Actually, the piece came out yesterday on the Rideshare Guy. Um, they're all in there. And uh, so it, it, you can nobody can refute that what we did is what we did because we took evidence and basically put it in the article. Um, so he brought this to my attention uh, April 13th of 2023. He goes, Sergio, you should look into this. I mean, look, I like digging. I like reading. I like presenting things to the viewers in a way that they could understand. Nobody is going to be interested to go read Prop 22 other than me <laughs> and maybe a few hand-selected people. It is like that's the same thing that I do every time I get a new TOS or terms of service by all these gig companies. They're like 30 pages of mumbo-jumbo legal stuff. Guess who reads it? I read it, right? Because I'm not going to sign it, number one. Number two, I want to know what they changed from the previous one because I have all the older, older versions of it to see like what the difference is, right? But that's well, what I and, do. On, you know. And I would say uh, it, it sounds trite, but but with the advent of artificial intelligence and gig apps, I would say the small print is now more critical. Absolutely. It, it sounds trite, but it, but it's true. More the small print's more critical than than ever before. Hundred because uh, information is king. Information. Oh, yeah. like what we said information yesterday. Information had... is is the omnipotent god of our world now, and and the corporations, particularly these gig app corporations, are thriving upon our information. Hundred percent. And you know they get it. They're getting it for free. <laughs> We're offering it to them. Um, but what we did was so first we went. You know, as soon as he sent that to me, I said, "Well, you know, send me a couple of links. Let me read the law." And then, sure enough, I read the law. I went to where he was pointing to. I mean, he literally did all the work and then, you know, put it in front of me. And um, so I go, well, we have something here. Um, then I started digging a little bit more. Then once I figured out there were 1.4 million gig workers in California, I go, um, I know a lot of people are going to look at this, you know, maybe not a big deal kind of a situation, right? Because, yeah, so what? They missed the adjustment, whatever it is. Then I started doing a little bit of a back of the envelope calculation. And um, so according to my numbers, um, the adjustment, the inflation adjustment that there was part of the law, which was left for the responsibility of the California treasurer to calculate and publish. Think about this. OK, I mean, come on. OK, um, so I figured it out that it should have been 32 cents for um 2022 which they did not pay which is just two cents right but two cents is two cents two and cents then, two, by, two cents multiplied by many or two cents multiplied by billions of miles <laughs> yeah billions i'm no joke and then um i figured that with the cpiu numbers that i had at my disposal they should have for 2023 the rate should have gone to 34 cents now we're talking four cents right and I, I go like, okay, so I figured, all right, let's say I'm an Uber Eats or DoorDash driver. Okay? And, and just to make sure I understand, you're benchmarking this just off the IRS? No, no, I'm, I'm benchmarking or... this off the CPIU, okay. CPI is Consumer Price Index, um, announced by the government what it was for 2021. Got and it, then got it, got just it. making it. So I figured it was 7.1%. That was the published number, right? Which is which is a lot higher, by the way. But the government always underestimates the <laughs> the CPIU numbers because they right. don't want to mess with interest rates, right? So and this is this is unexpectedly high for any time. Period. Very high Inflation. because for the last fifteen years we were running like less than one percent. So that's why when these companies put that in there, they didn't figure, oh, inflation could be out of control, <laughs> right? And uh, you know that was one percent, so it's going to go from thirty cents to thirty and a half cents, no big deal, kind of a thing. But then, no, it was a lot. So it should have been, so drivers should have gotten paid this adjustment 
instead of getting paid at 30 cents a mile, they should have gotten paid for 32 cents a mile for all of 2022. And they should have gotten paid for at, at 34 cents a mile for all of 2023. So as I said, we're at April 13th. The first adjustment, according to the law, should have been made January of 2022, which was not made. Second one should have been made um, January of 2023, which was not made. So now we're talking 17 months now. Now we're in the end of April. So Sergio, it's so there's there's another type of funny math though, right? Is that when we talk about miles, because miles to the IRS and miles to the gig to the gig economy uh, companies are two different things. Miles to the IRS start when you leave your house and end when you come back home at night. Yep. Explain yep. what miles for the gig economy are and why. Uh, if I do forty-five to sixty thousand miles a year, how many of those are actually going to be counted toward? Oh, they're going to they're going to account for much less than of your total miles. Now you can take right. the deduction as a gig worker when you're doing your taxes at sixty-five and a half cents. That's Correct. why that's why ninety-nine percent of gig workers don't really pay any taxes. They're right. playing almost that arbitrage that you're getting paid for active. You they report to the IRS and back to you on your ten ninety-nine on active miles basis. Now you could be driving around, you know, all day long looking for a trip, right? Right. IRS will allow that, but these companies don't consider that you're working. You're just, I go then, I mean, my question for the CEOs was, well, what do you think I'm doing out there with your app on? What, what right. do you think I'm doing? Like, you think I'm like uh, digging ditches? No, I'm looking for work, man. Right. Right. But this but, is, this is again, the deception upon which the industry is based is that they're able to present numbers that in general represent some fraction of reality and present Absolutely. those and present those as a business case. And I want to, I want to let you keep going on this story, but you know, we're going to get to at the end of this, what kind of business this really is. Cause that's, yeah, that's yeah, going to be a, yeah. that's going to be a yeah. question we're going to ask ourselves at the end, but please continue with your story. I just wanted to notice that when to make people think when they're thinking about miles, it's not the miles that no, no. you would use in any other business, by the way. Like, let's right. say that you work for a small business and the, and the owner says, hey, Jeff, I need you to uh, run, up to, run up to Seattle, like pick up yeah. a box of stuff and come back. So you're going to get paid for your time and you're going to get paid for your mileage reimbursed directly from the IRS. So that's the way it would work if you were yeah. an employee, right? Yeah. Is that you're doing this on your employed time and because it's your personal car you get a right. reimbursement. So, so the, and, and the final thing I want to say before I flip this over to you is the fact that when we say that these people don't pay any taxes, there's also a reason for that. And it's that their gross income is so low at the end of the year yeah. that they are not liable for taxes. So this is, this is a double-edged sort of, of not paying taxes. If you, if you have no income and you don't have a job, not paying well, taxes. If you're not paying taxes. mean, it always means even as a large corporation, that means you're not making enough money. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so let me let you continue on with prop 22, but I want to put the right. two caveats in there. No important points, obviously. So, um, so, you know, once we did all this calculations, you know, we, I talked to Pablo and uh, I said, you know, I mean, I will call the treasurer's, um, California treasurer's office, you know, but I think it'll be better if you call as a driver, because if I call and introduce myself, I'm like, oh, I'm the red chair guy, this, this and that. I go, they may not talk to me because, you know, then they may look at me as a journalist. You know, I'm just, I, I was like, more like, let's not create some suspicion here. Let's just dig around. The, let's just snoop around a little bit. Let's sniff around. Let's see what's going on here. I assume you're, the, you're like, you know, if, if oh, I'm, I'm falling like over you're slapping your head, not believing what you've just found, right? Yeah, I'm just salivating. I'm going like, holy crap. This is <laughs> Did I just big, find right? a billion dollars? Yeah, and I'm going like, wow, for this, poor is, people? this could be a lot of money. And uh, a lot of money. But long story short, um, Pablo, we have, again, it's on our website. You can go look at the article. Um, his call logs are there. So on April 13th at 2 o'clock, um, he called the California Treasurer's Office as a driver, started asking them about this so-called inflation adjustment that was supposed to be made and published by them, by their office. Because as I previously mentioned, the, the, the companies, you know, just said, well, it's her job. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, so when we called, um, the first person who answered the phone had absolutely no idea what we were talking about. She didn't even know what Prop 22 was. I'm like, okay, that's kind of strange. 
Um, and in fact, she directed us to the IRS website where the standard mileage deduction of 65 and a half cents is. So we tried to wrangle her back in. <laughs> so I said, lady, no, no, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about something different here. We're not talking federal. We're talking state law, which is Proposition 22. So I guess she looked at it and then turned the call over to some other person at the California Treasurer's Office. It wasn't Fiona Ma. We didn't have the pleasure to talk to her. Um, so that person comes on and says, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we did. We, we know about this adjustment. I'm like, OK, then why wasn't it made? And she said, we didn't make it because um, Prop 22, as you know, <laughs> to us, like, no, we know, <laughs> was under litigation, she said. I was like, um, no, Prop 22 is the law of the land. It wasn't under litigation. Now, granted, it was being appealed in the appellate court because August of 2021, and a, a judge um, threw out Prop 22, right. you know, considered it unconstitutional. Right. Well, immediately after that, the companies appealed, right, to the appellate court. So it was being on appeal. It wasn't, you know, so we kind of took her word. I mean, this is the California Treasurer's Office. They should know what the heck they're talking about, right? Right. And uh, we hung up. <laughs> And I said, yeah, there is a point to that. I mean, you know, but we'll continue digging, you know, talk to some legal scholars and, and people who actually know what they're doing. They do this for a living. And we got it. We got we did our due diligence, got a couple of opinions from a couple of legal scholars. They both said, no, no, they're wrong. California Treasurer's Office is wrong. You know, it is in effect. Prop 22 is in effect, but it's just under appeal. So now I'm thinking, okay, so let's throw the California treasurer under the bus <laughs> and do an article for me or for our website, right? Which, I don't know, we have close to 200,000 subscribers on the website, on the blog side. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going like, no, this is like 1.4 million workers in California. I think we could amplify this. So my advantage over most people is that I'm friends or acquaintances of a lot of journalists in the mainstream media because they come to us when they're writing a piece asking our opinion you know they quote me if they quote me and whatever so I, I said well who would do this justice you know first I wanted to make sure that it was a local not local but a California paper like a, a Washington Times may not do may not care about California because this is a California issue very, very but much. as California goes so goes every other state so you know but um very much so. And I would say that, I mean, look, the, these companies, California is kind of ground zero from yeah. from the from Silicon Valley aspect to investment aspect to the fact that, you know, DoorDash started in Palo Alto with All Stanford grads and the Y All Combinator yeah. and the Stanford startup garage course. So this is this is a California industry that is Absolutely. in effect kind of taking over the world. And, and yeah. uh, well, they I, all I don't, I, I don't say that facetiously and I say that with great terror. Uh, yeah. So, but this is a, this is a California issue, but one that has now uh, global significance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, global look, you know, Uber, Uber started in San Francisco, Lyft started in San Francisco. There's a California and these are all California, you know, Birth com and these companies. companies were built. These companies were built prior to the pandemic to be able to survive in dense urban areas. No yeah. gig company was ever built to deliver to Dubuque, Iowa, and Bloomington, yeah. Indiana. They were they were Obviously, never yeah. built for that because there's no profit in it. So well, I'm yeah, gonna let you continue you, you on about, with you know, your if story. you look at if you look at their if you look at their earnings reports and 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 their um side at, at the scale that they are you know uber and lifts and and lyft especially um doordash all these major names you know close to 25 to 27 percent of their sales comes from california that's massive now if you consider uber alone between rideshare and food delivery uber's top line is reaching close to 140 billion dollars a year right and 27% of that is close to $30 billion. That's a lot, right? So and not, on, not only that, these companies all subtract 
the cost of labor prior to reporting that net revenue. So there's great secrecy from all these companies about how much they actually pay to drivers in any given market, in any given circumstance. They will and not, it, exactly. They and will it's, not and it's, a, it's a moving target. And so this yeah, is- they will not release that. They, you know, Uber always releases a global number. I'm like, um, no, yes. I want to know how much an LA driver is making. You have those numbers. You should release yeah. those numbers. Right? But, but, but again, th- there's a reason for this, right? Is well, of course there is. Of, this of course, is a scam. Look, they, and if the real numbers were ever released, we would all realize instantly uh, this is a scam uh, if we didn't already. So anyway, yeah. please, please yeah. carry on with so, Prop 22. No, we're, 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 you know, we'd, we'd call the treasurers and they gave us the excuse why they didn't publish this inflation adjustment. Um, I'm like, okay, now we have a bigger story here because we, that's what she said, whoever was at the treasurer's office is not correct. I mean, you know, we got our legal opinion. So being friends with a bunch of journalists, so I thought, okay, you know, who would do this justice? But I had worked with Brian before. Literally a month ago, he had done an article on Vina Dubal's algorithmic wage discrimination article. And we literally were like half the article. Uh, and I want to would have put in an amazing plug. I'm very excited to say Vina is going to be a guest on the podcast soon. So oh, awesome. um, she, she's, she's quite an amazing uh, law professor and yes. writer and academic and, and labor uh, advocate. So very excited yeah. about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's uh, she's uh, you know the leading scholar when it comes to labor law, probably in the country. So, um, but anyway, and then um, uh, I said, you know, who would do this justice? You know, I you know I know Brian at LA Times. Like I said, he had done the Venus article um, about a month, exactly almost a month before then on algorithmic wage discrimination. Now Vina had her points that she was making with her study or her paper that had just come out, but. Unbeknownst to her and Brian, we had done our, we've been doing our own tests on algorithmic wage discrimination, meaning putting two drivers side by side and both of them are getting two different prices for the exact same job. But right. we had the data, we had the evidence. And the, basically our evidence completed, it was like our Tetris piece that they were missing in the article. And when I sent it to Brian at LA Times, Brian Merchant was an amazing author on his own right, besides being a journalist, is that He says, can I use this? I go, sure, knock yourself out. (laughs) All our videos and all our articles, all our numbers are in there. And so now I had created this relationship, a trusting relationship between Brian Merchant of LA Times. I'm going like, you know what? I trust him. He trusts me. He had just done a piece. Okay. So I package all this with all the screenshots, with all the evidence, and I go, send it to Brian. And Brian looks at it. Two days later, he comes back. He goes, you know, I have to do my own due diligence on this, but my editors love it. I think we're going to do it. I'm like, great. I go, keep me posted. Well, of course, he calls the treasurer's office. Treasurer's office says the same thing to to Brian, you know, and then he calls the companies, and companies said, no, she was supposed to do the adjustment. It was not on to us. You know, we, we have nothing to do with it. You know, uh, kicking the ball back and forth, you know, uh, <laughs> typical gig world uh, stuff that we've been used to for the last decade. And um, he also called Vina Dubal um, for a legal opinion. Um, and she said the same thing. Nope, Prop 22 was the law of the land. Nothing to do with, uh, you know, <laughs> with them making an excuse of it, saying that that's why they did not publish. Incorrect. I'm like, okay, so Brian goes, all right, we're going all in. I'm like, okay, Brian. So um, we hadn't heard anything um, from the treasurer's office after our April 13th call. You know, I'm going like, okay, now I'm going to call them up. And, uh, you know, I called, introduced myself. I'm doing a piece on Prop 22 inflation adjustment. You know, I need to speak to somebody about this. I think it was the same person Pablo spoke to. And they came on and gave me the same spiel. They said, no, it's under litigation. That's why we didn't publish. But I pushed a little bit further than that. I said, do you have any um documentation or any correspondence in january of 2020 from the gig companies to you alerting you that part of the law you have to publish this adjustment so we can pay our workers they said yeah there we had correspondence doordash reached out to us uber reached out to us but we told them the same thing we're telling you i'm going like i'm not buying any of this okay So I go, um, you know, I still have it on. I have a FOIA, as you know, Freedom of Information Act request. (laughs) I want to see these emails going back and forth between the 
you know, between the treasurer's office and uh, these companies, right? Well, you know, these things take time. Um, in, I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's still there. Uh, but now it's actually a moot point, actually, because um, the story ran. Um, so um, we said, okay, we'll go to social media now. So I said, Pablo, you tweet with Fiona Ma tagged, the California treasurer, on your tweet with the same text message basically you sent me. So he did that. So I amplified it some more, right? You know, we know how the Twitter world goes. You can put something on fire in about five minutes, you know. Um, so now we're waiting. It's April 4th now. That tweet went out April 4th. Our original call was April, uh, sorry. Our original call was May 13th. My call was May 24th. His tweet went out on April 4th, all right? So at, this, at the same time now, you know, Brian is working on the story, calling the parties, trying to figure out what the angle is on the story. And um, May 10th comes, Pablo like texts me. He goes, look at this. I'm like, what is what's happening? <laughs> and sure enough, May 10th of 2023, after the initial tweet on May 4th, Fiona Ma, the California Treasurer's Office, tweets us, Pablo, tagging Pablo, saying, spread the word, I made the adjustment. I'm going like, and then she puts the website on there saying that go visit the website. Sure enough, I click on the website. It's still there. The first box says California gig worker inflation adjustment. Like I click on it. Sure enough, just like I told Jeff, 32 cents for all of 2022, 34 cents for all of 2023. Black and white on the California Treasurer's website. So now I have like, okay, now we have her published this finally. But then this goes to show how incorrect she was, right? So March of 2023, the appellate court with a three to two vote voted, the judges voted, that Prop 22 was constitutional overruling the judge's decision from 2021. Okay. So, and that was on, you know, lucky of all days. That was on March 15th of 2023. And that's right. the day, that's the day I met Pablo for dinner. First time I had not met him. That, that's wild. Because that and that was big news. That was that, that was, was because the day. what happened. What happened, Jeff, is that I was we were just about to have dinner and the ruling came out. My phone blew up. Like uh, Market Watch called me. Um, mm -hmm. New York Times called me. He goes, Can you give us a comment? We're doing an article. So I delayed Pablo for like 45 minutes talking to journalists because and it if you go look at Market Watch, Levy. How, how ironic Levy. is that? Yeah, how ironic is that, right? Out of all days. <laughs> Out of all days. And so, so to, to make sure that everyone understands, because this is this is somewhat of a long story, but also a very interesting and important story to this to this podcast and, and our work. Uh this made this ruling on March 15th made international news and I yep. think was looked at around the world as really a landmark ruling relative to the gig economy and employment and and it had the community that the sergio broadcast to the the gig economy worker community the low-age work and gig app worker community paying attention and debating amongst themselves was this good for them was this bad for them yep. do they want to be independent contractors do they want to be independent regardless of whether this particular prop 22 actually did those things this was very symbolic of much more even than prop two in, in california i think yeah you know absolutely. that and, that and was and this is a landmark in in labor economy for the united states and i don't want to underplay that it is because that's what the gig economy is and so when these shifts are happening what sergio yeah. found here i mean if there's cutting edge edge legislation in the world and i didn't say good legislation i said cutting edge legislation in the world it's in california and prop 22 and seattle and some other some other jurisdictions i still don't think it's good enough but but sergio so march 15th you get this ruling and a lot of, and some people were happy and some people were mad. Why were the people happy that were happy? And why were the people upset that were upset? Well, obviously the, the people who were happy were the gig companies because it was like a huge victory for them. And then Prop 22 is going to stay in, a, in a, the way the law is opaque and convoluted, the way it's written, obviously they go like, okay, status quo, we continue. 
because if Prop 22 was you know, considered unconstitutional by the appellate court as well, obviously they were going to appeal it to the California Supreme Court. But now two out of three, the chances of California Supreme Court throwing out a, you know, Prop 22 and again, AB5 becoming law and all these gig workers becoming their employees was a very high likelihood, right? So there was a, it was, they were very happy with it, right? And they've but invested the at this side, point about a quarter of a billion dollars in in PR for this thing. Yeah, yeah. And and so so that day, it, it, out of all days, you know, um, you know, once the ruling came out, so now we're, we're you know, I was going to actually call the treasurer's office one more time while Brian was working articles. I got bored. I was like, I go, okay. The ruling came on March 15th, Miss Treasurer, okay? Why didn't you publish the number on March 16th? Because it became the law of the land. March 17th, March 20th, April uh -huh. 5th, April 10th, <laughs> April and 13th. Every day is a good day. Yeah, that's okay. I go like, why? Because, you know, it kind of actually made her point of, of BSing us and telling us that, oh, it's under litigation. That just made it completely disappear because the day she published on May 10th, Prop 22 now is being appealed by the other side to the California Supreme Court. So it's still the same thing, being appealed. So I'm like, which one is it? So when it was first being appealed, it's under litigation, but now you publish on May 10th while it was being appealed exactly like it was being appealed before. So I'm going like, but then I go, you know what? Don't push your luck. <laughs> just keep it, keep where you're at. So she publishes it. Now, one thing is for the California treasurer to publish these rates. Another thing is, are they going to pay? <laughs> because to me, it's like, you know, they collect fast, these gig companies, but they don't pay out fast. <laughs> they, we know from all the tip baiting and all the, you know, all the stuff that goes on in our delivery world, especially our delivery world. And, and I was like, okay, but you know, I go small victory. Brian was happy about it. He's working on the article. So we want to talk about it. Brian goes, no, well, LA, Brian Merchant, LA Times, he goes, no, you guys should hold off because it's going to be big news when we release it. I'm going like, okay, Brian, okay, I'll give you this one. But so about a week goes by. So my I do Uber Eats. My wife does DoorDash and Uber Eats as well. We are extreme, extreme cherry pickers. Like I, my acceptance rate on Uber Eats and DoorDash is 9%. My wife's is a little higher than mine. Um, so we're in, involved in this now, you know? So I'm going like, okay, I think we're going to get some money <laughs> mm -hmm. if they pay retroactively. Right. <laughs> my, con my concern was that because she published on May 10th, 2023, 17 and a half months late, <laughs> my concern was like, they're going to go, okay, well, we're only responsible from May 10th, 2023. We're going to pay 34 cents a month. Mm -hmm. I'm going like, if they do that, is I got to be ready with a massive class action lawsuit because we know it wasn't legal because you can't just say just because the treasurer didn't publish, we're not going to pay for 2022 and 2023 because her adjustment clearly said, it's on, our, on the, her website, people, you can go check it out, 32 cents for 2022 and 34 cents for 2023. And she didn't put in starting May 10th or anything like that. She put all those back dates, right? So I'm going like, we better have something ready to go in case these companies don't pay retroactively. Well, to my joy and surprise, um, my wife got the DoorDash email on a Friday and DoorDash said, we're going to pay you between May 22 and May 29th retroactively going back to January 2022 and retroactive going back to January 2023 at the 32 cents and 34 cent a mile rate. So, of course, my head's buzzing now. I'm going like, okay, how many miles did you drive? Because as a nerd, I keep track of every single trip that I have made on the delivery platforms, right? And I know I was going to get paid for active miles. Well, I have also kept a, kept track of each trip's active miles, according to Uber Eats and DoorDash. Well, I knew that I drove 3,576 miles for 1,100 deliveries actively since July of 2022. So I did my calculations. I go, I think I'm going to get like $88.
from Uber Eats. So my wife, of course, doesn't do any of that. And I, I bet 1% of drivers do what I do, right? Now, um, two days after that, Uber Eats sent me an email. Again, all these screenshots with our names, personal names in there, but everybody knows my name anyway, so there's nothing to hide. Um, they're all in, in my article with all their emails. And all the money that we received as a family from DoorDash and Uber Eats, all the screenshots are in there as well. Well, sure enough, Uber was the second one announcing that we're going to get paid. And first announcement was by DoorDash, then it was Uber Eats, then it was Lyft. And about three days after Uber's email to their drivers all over California, they were the first ones to pay. And I got $85.75 for this adjustment because part of my mileage was 2022, part of my mileage was 2023. Now I'm thinking I only drove 3,576 miles. So I'm a cherry picker. I did 1,100 deliveries, but I only drove 3,576 miles, meaning about three and a half miles per trip, right? Short pickup That's, or drop off. That could easily so be. I got 85, right? So my wife got 117 from Uber Eats and then close to $130 from DoorDash. So in our family alone, we got like 300 plus dollars. And we are super part-time, maybe five, eight, 10 hour a week drivers, right? Right. So, so that's thinking, maybe that's maybe 10%, 20% of what a lot of uh, drivers would be doing in terms of time and mileage. Absolutely. Yeah. And 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 then I'm thinking now, okay, if I'm a full-time Uber Eats and DoorDash, a Grubhub, Instacart driver, right? Um, I'm easily driving three to four, maybe 5,000 miles a month if I'm throwing in some ride share in there uh, a month. This is 17 months. This is 80,000 miles I've right. driven. That's right. 80,000 miles times two cents and four cents. Like, I, you're going to get like two, three grand out of this thing. Mm -hmm. Now, multiply that by so called 25% of, you know, full time drivers in California out of the 1.4 million, right? Now we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars now. <laughs> And I was so like, so let's talk about this on a scale because any of us could have a, a, a thought about what uh, a few hundred dollars or a thousand or three thousand or four thousand dollars might mean to us. But remember the assertions from uh, politicians and and prognosticators and economists that said a, a sixteen hundred stimulus uh, was enough to to drive people into not working was enough to drive yeah. inflation was enough to do all these things so so we're talking about a demographic here that according to our politicians and and bureaucrats uh this is a life-changing amount of money to I, I think one of them said couldn't you get by by for a few months on 1600 bucks or do you say for a couple of years i can't remember yeah. what what yeah. the guy said so this is a massive amount of money to yeah. the people we're talking about who are who are uh, maybe making some money on on the gig economy, maybe losing some money on the gig economy. Maybe they're not even in the gig economy anymore. Now that's a big problem, isn't it? Well, Sergio? we're gonna yeah, I'm gonna explain it to your audience that as well. So, so, um, so we got the money. I mean, we're happy. Look, the best money you get in this on this planet is the money you didn't have yesterday, <laughs> and you didn't expect it at all. It just showed up. You're like, wow. It's like thanks. So. So now, you know, and then Brian, our Brian Merchant's wonderful article came out last Thursday. And now since then, obviously, you know, things have blown up and whatever. And we had our pictures, obviously, on the front cover, me and Pablo. And um, so we uncovered this, right? And the companies are all paying retroactively. That's the victory part, right? But now here comes the dirty part that a lot of people don't talk about. And while well, I'm definitely not shy i'm going to talk about it every chance i get and in fact you know um without giving much more to come that's all i can say okay but what i can e clearly easily say is that when all those commercials that i was watching on cnn and all these other channels during the prop 22 campaign for 220 million dollars okay not single one not one mentioned that Prop 22, that's written by these companies as benefits to California drivers or California driver benefits package that we discussed previously. Mm -hmm. None of this is funded by these companies. None of it. Not one penny 
has been spent other than the 220, 220 million to pass this law. Right. Not one penny goes out of their pocket as California driver benefits. How do I know that? Well, I'm also a consumer on all these platforms. And I have screenshots up the wazoo um, from me and other people, consumers. Every single time. I'm, again, I'm in L.A. County, but California, consider California a huge country. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's right. Um, I... I have screenshots of my receipts. As of January of 2020, these companies started collecting from the consumer, the end consumer, let it be rideshare passenger, Instacart delivery consumer. Unreal. Or DoorDash food delivery consumer. Anywhere between 45 cents to $1.50 on each order and people, if you're a consumer, whip out your receipts. They're all on there, clearly. On In LA County, I can give my example. In LA that's, a, County, that's a massive amount of money right no, there. No, no, wait, 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 that's a good one. Watch the back of the envelope on that one, Jeff, right? So 75 cents, each single rideshare trip, the consumer is charged 75 cents in LA County. Look at your receipts, it's all there. On each Uber Eats trip, it's 99 cents. 99 cents on each each single Uber Eats trip. On each DoorDash trip, it's between 99 cents and a buck fifty to the consumer. And it clearly is there's a line item on all these receipts says California driver benefits. I'm like, okay. So now what Prop 22 had passed in November of 2019, if they said, oh, by the way, this is going to be consumer funded, would that would it have gotten 59% of the vote? I highly doubt it. Because mm. anytime you tell the consumer you're going to pay for this, they're going to go. Right. No, so no, how did money. they, how, did they just not touch on they that? Issue? Not even, not, nobody's we just didn't talk it, about where the money was going to come from, but it came, well, money does come magically in the gig economy industry. So, you know, they did well, have that's the money out. tree that they have, but you know, but yeah. but that, but the point is, so now more my head spinning some more. Now I'm happy everybody's getting money. I'm getting emails. You know, oh, I got 1,100 from Uber. I got 700 from DoorDash. I'm like, great. I go, okay, great, cool. Um, but now this is a law that was written by them. This is a law that mm. everybody was asleep at the wheel until we kind of go, hey, hello. <laughs> And, and can, can we just say that this law was written by the best of the best yes. of the best, most powerful legal minds in this nation? No That's doubt. who wrote this law. No so, doubt. So, like, this is not small ball. This is no, people no. who used to work at the White House using their influence yeah. in California. No, no That's doubt. how this shit gets done. No doubt. No okay. doubt. And, 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 and look, look, you get what you pay for, right? So I'm sure... I'm sure they paid for it. Damn um, right. Damn right. Uh, the lead attorney for DoorDash made $17 million in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, and and, and Tony West, uh, his latest bonus check was more than anybody would make in a lifetime. And, and who Tony is Tony, West, who is Tony West? I think he made $12 million, just the bonus part. Overall, he made like $20 million last year. And who's Tony West? He's the chief legal counsel for Uber. Yep, there you go. Who so, happens? Who happens to be? Who happens to be Kamala Harris's brother-in-law? Right. So, so people are getting stinking rich off this, but it's yeah, 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 yeah. It's except uh, except me, the, 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 the gig worker. Right. But anyway, so so you know, before I leave, um, so now I know um, that the consumer is paying for this without probably even knowing that they're paying for it. Because who looks at their receipt? They just get the food and eat it and forget about it. Or they, you take a rideshare trip to LAX in 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 LA. You know, they're going to look 75 cents. Who's going to pay attention? Well, if anybody looked at their DoorDash receipts, they would never order DoorDash again. So nobody. Uh, probably, probably. But, you know, I, I look at it. And uh, so now I was like, well, this was a lot of money that they paid out. But this was not money that they did not have that they had to open the bank accounts and write the checks for. They were already holding sitting on this money since 2020. And this is a fraction of that money. This is probably 10%. That's I would, I, if I were to guess, because look, when we're doing deliveries, there's no transparency, okay? 
when we got the money, uh, the only one that mentioned when they sent the money was Uber, to their credit. They said, California inflation adjustment, and the money showed up. DoorDash's money showed up as, on a Friday at 8 p.m., because mine hit, my wife hit, everybody that I know hit. Literally, you can't click on it. There is no line item. Doesn't mention Prop 22. It was just money that just showed up. Doesn't say anything. Nothing. Nothing. It's just money that showed up. So Classic. when you're working, when you're working, there is no transparency. When they're paying you, there is no transparency, right? But besides that, how many people, Jeff, do what I do and figured out exactly down to the tenth of a mile how many active miles I drove, right? I'm look. I'm looking at him. No, uh, yeah, a yeah. few, very few. One percent. Okay. So 1.4 million people are getting money. Look, I am. I have absolutely not no doubt. I have had people email me, Serge, I got 60 cents because I did one single delivery. I'm like, okay, you got 60 cents. And I, my high so far has been one driver, 1,100 on Uber and 700 on DoorDash. They got it, which is but, good money. But, now, but there are people as we were, we were living. Oh, like me, that- like 100, 200, 300, 500. I got, multiple, I got hundreds of emails like that. And there are people that also quit the biz. And well, that's the, I'm going to talk about that in the remaining few minutes that we have. Yeah. So, so once we figure out this is paid by the consumer, okay, I go back and do the same a little back of the because look, I am hundred percent sure. If we go to these companies, they will say, okay, DoorDash, what did this cost you? They're going to go take a hike. They're not going to tell us. They're, and 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 as t- un- lack of transparency exists, the money showed up. How about this? How about a breakdown for all the people who don't who are not nerds like me and do their you know spreadsheets, right? Sir, you drove eleven thousand and five hundred and forty-five active miles, and this is your adjustment. They know that they have all these numbers because if you're sending me the dollars on this column, you know what the other column is, is miles. Okay, you know, you know that DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub, Instacart, all of you, you know that. But let's pass that on as well. So I go like, okay, so again, small calculation for your audience to understand the size and the scope. Uber just by themselves did 2.1 billion individual trips globally in the last quarter, earnings quarter. In, individ, this is not dollars. This is individual trips, global, because they don't break it down. Well, we know what percentage of their businesses in California is about 25 to 27% of overall business. Well, what is that? That's 500 million trips or deliveries in California alone in one single quarter. One. Mm-hmm. And on that's average, only one. Seven, and that's one company. One company. We're not talking Lyft, DoorDash. DoorDash is probably another 100 million. Lyft is another 100 million. We're talking like six, eight, seven, whatever, 100 million trips per quarter. Mm-hmm. So, Starting last quarter, going back to the you know initial days of Prop 22, which is January of 2020. That's three and a half years ago. How many quarters are in a, in a year, Jeff? Four. Figure this out now. If just Uber did 500 million trips and collected from the consumer anywhere between 75 cents and 90 or 45 cents to 99 cents, because in each county, the, the, the money that they charge the consumer for Prop 22 is different. Like in Orange County in California, it's like 55 cents. San Francisco, I think, is 55 cents up, you know, all these different counties, right? But on average, let's say it's 75 cents between Uber Eats and Rideshare. That's 350 plus million dollars for one quarter for Prop 22 they collected from the yeah. consumer. Yeah, this is billions and billions of dollars. Billions of dollars, right? So now I go, where's the beef? Now, okay. Now, this has happened already, which was expected. We call the companies. We go, well, so since Prop 22, this 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 debacle that you guys faced was such a failure on everybody's part, from the treasurer to you to whoever and neglected to pay money that was not even yours, but it was actually sitting in your accounts collecting interest for all these years, right? It's not like they did something out of the ordinary and they said, oh, here, drivers, here, look we're how much money we're going to pay. And, and, and we, don't, we don't know what account this is in. They could have dumped it in their general fund for all we know. We, we have no idea. We don't we know called, that this we, is even set aside. They may no, have just pocketed it. We called Uber. We called DoorDash. 
we said, who has the accounting of this? <laughs> yeah, well, you know what their answer was? Uh, what? No, there was take a hike. I'm like, okay, all right, no problem. Because, you know, if you guys are watching Uber Lyft, and I said this yesterday on my channel, um, this ain't over. <laughs> oh, goodness. No, okay. So, so figure this. This could be like billions of dollars that they were holding on in a slush fund or whatever the money is. The money is somewhere because, you know, on the Uber receipt, it says California driver benefit, and there is three asterisks, you know, for small print. Well, mm -hmm. we read the small print. We went and figured it out, and it, we put a screenshot, and again, it's in the article. It says, this is paid by the rider, meaning the passenger, for the rideshare trip, directly to Uber, it says. <laughs> I'm like, okay, then mm -hmm. you know, if you're doing four or 500 million trips between deliveries and rideshare, collecting the money, three, 400 million a quarter, times... 12 quarters, meaning three and a half years worth, going back. Just you, Uber, have like $3 billion of this Prop 22 slush fund? I, I, I would love to say that this is criminal fraud. I, I don't really like to say I, I don't know yet. I, I, I'm about, I don't know. So I don't um, know that. I don't know that either. And we're not attorneys general. But well, this is this uh, is what very. Did you just say? What did you just say? Attorney general. We are not attorneys you? general. Uh, okay, well, that's all right. So take a hint, people. Um, yeah. So anyway, so I'm going like this is like five six billion dollars potentially sloshing around. I know yeah. for a fact. Mm -hmm. I was a rideshare driver under Prop 22 for two and a half years until I started doing deliveries. I didn't get one penny. <laughs> so I don't think they're putting that that six billion out. Now I have scoured all their earnings reports because I listened to it. There is not a single line item anywhere in their earnings reports. Nowhere. No, no, no. There's so they not. could have they could be like using this money for other purposes. I almost look at this like money laundering. <laughs> and I'm like, but let's not accuse them of anything yet, right? So, I, I I scour the reports as well, and that's why I made that point before that nothing. drivers and driver pay is taken out before net income that's even reported on the reports. Drivers don't well, exist. Drivers yeah, do yeah. not exist in the world of of gig economy from a from a financial standpoint. It's a little bit different for rideshare. I, I'm going to say it from a DoorDash standpoint, drivers don't exist. No, it's the same for rideshare. It's the same for rideshare. They take it off the top. Uh, but my my concern is that now. Okay, if this law was such a failure and you guys are pushing clones of this all over the country, all over the world, basically, there's a precedence now here. This they wrote it. Law. They this wrote is a it. Law, right? So this law should not, first of all, be accepted by any legislature anywhere in the country, right? Because we, this Point needs one. to be written, this needs to be written properly because this is not done properly. <laughs> and and if, if a California treasurer and these billion dollar companies were asleep at the wheel, why, why, what, what would make it different if it was run in Connecticut or if it was run in Massachusetts, the same type of law, right? Well, and, right. and I was going to ask you, is there any corollary to this in Washington State or in New York where there have been other uh, laws? Passed? No, New York, New York has it right. Washington State had it right. Well, we know what happened in uh, Colorado, and which I was behind that bill 100%, Stephanie V. Hill's bill, the Transparency and Anti-Deactivation Bill. It failed by two Democrats shooting it down, a Democratic bill. And we know what happened in Minnesota a couple of weeks ago. You know, governor, Democratic governor vetoed first time in his life <laughs> a Democratic bill, which was going to give drivers some more money, which was wow. basically... Those are, those, are, those are huge developments, right? That, that yeah, absolutely, seeing, yeah. Absolutely. They keep winning, the party, man. These companies keep winning. And I'm the like... Par the party that would ostensibly be of labor... Yeah. And and ostensibly be supported by uh, by labor and and even unions is against developments yeah. and and that's yeah. when so I, I want to let you finish this but as we wrap up I want to I want to talk to you about that in terms of uh, you know I, I, I want to know your view on the fact that well, I, this I, is I, so I mean, openly this is yeah. so openly done and that our leaders, whether they be bureaucrats or politicians, are looking the other way. Because that's that's not by accident. This is not no. an oversight. No, I don't think it is. But, you know, let, let, so on this Prop 22 situation, everybody got good money. I am 100% sure now, 
from all the feedback I'm getting last few days from drivers all over the all over California is that they're getting from pennies to thousands of dollars. But every single person who has done even a single right single okay, this may not be for rideshare drivers because most rideshare drivers, the way the law is written, is for them not to get Prop 22 benefits. That's a fact because of the minimum wage law and active time, you're you're making more money. But if you have done gig work in the last mile delivery space, any one of these companies, right? Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub, Instacart, especially during the pandemic, um, all these companies, if you had done one single delivery, you're going to get from pennies. And if you were a full timer, you're going to get into the thousands of dollars. So out of 1.4 million, I don't know how many that is, but enjoy the cash. Our gift to you. <laughs> but now the bigger story, because now that I have this relationship with all these major news, you know, mainstream media, let's call them, or um, digital media or journalists, personal relationships. But now they trust me that whatever I take them is not going to be BS, right? And I put a good package together and it's national and, and well, major story, if not national story. So now they're all like, Serge, you have something for me. Serge, you have something for me. I go, yeah, I'm working on things. In fact, if any of you have read Brian Merchant's wonderful article that came out last Thursday, I would urge you to all to go read the last paragraph of that article. He says, as for Sergio, he's already working on the next chapter. And that's a hint for you all. Stay tuned because this Prop 22 thing must, must be scrutinized, number one. Look, I'm not against Prop 22. I'm making money every week on Prop 22. And, and, and the, the, the point is, I never got a penny doing rideshare from Prop 22. But the second I started doing deliveries, immediately the first week I got Prop 22 because people who do delivery who are naive enough to not understand that doing deliveries is working for tips, just like the guy next to the highway putting a sign up saying, I work for food. Mm -hmm. You people are working for tips with base rates at $2 for orders at Uber Eats and DoorDash. So you have to figure that out. You know who benefited this most, Jeff? All those drivers who don't know any better, who mm -hmm. accepted those $2 five-mile orders for DoorDash in California. And they're getting boku bucks now because of what we figured, figured out. But right. the next chapter that hopefully it's going to be us and LA Times and Brian again um, is going to be... Where's the beef? Um, you know, you mentioned the AG. Um, where's the beef? Six, five, six, yeah, eight so, billion dollars? Where's so the it's, money? it's interesting. I can ask this question because it's 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 my show. I've never said that before. It's my show. My question would be to the Attorney General of California, where are all of the funds from all of the companies being kept? Where is that money? Who's managing it? How has it been managed? How has it been accumulated? And what communications between the companies exist on how it's calculated and dispersed? Because herein lies the dirty secrets of the gig economy. And that's what you've really uncovered here. And that's what that's what Sergio is alluding to. And that's why Sergio is on the show. He said this is this is maybe one of the first major chinks in the armor of gig economy companies at least since the pandemic they have been skating away under the noses of of le of of legislators and bureaucrats because nobody has any information or data on the industry and so unless somebody legally gets hooks in somewhere to actually find some data they've done an incredible job of obscuring it so you know Sergio and I can impute how many rides they have or we can take you know, we can take gross numbers and try and impute worldwide and by market, you know, what they're making. But the fact is, nobody really knows anything about well, the operations of these companies in terms of... Yeah, but of I think, I think look, I think 59% of the voters who voted for Prop 22 are the ones that are paying, and the ones that did not vote for Prop 22, are the ones paying for California driver benefits. I think they need to know where their money is going. They absolutely deserve to know they've been defrauded, and that's where that's where state attorney generals come in and say, oh, stay tuned. where are these stay funds? <laughs> so, yeah, so so yeah. stay stay tuned. That's very exciting. So so um, uh, one key point I know we've alluded to it: people that fell out of this system and and aren't 
at the same contact or banking information as they had for may not even yeah. get this okay. money. So, so I, I've lot. gotten a few, the great, great that you reminded me of that. I've gotten emails. So, you know, we talked about this on yesterday's Show Me the Money episode. Please go watch it. And and this came to me like uh, I was talking to Brian because now we talk almost every other day. Um, and Brian Merchant. Um, and um, I said, you know, I just thought about this. So let's say from January 2022 to December of 2022, you work for DoorDash. Okay. Well, you work for 30 cents, but you should have worked for 32 cents. So that two cent adjustment is yours. What if DoorDash deactivated you January of 2023? So you should get that money. I mean, <laughs> right? The adjustment, right? That's right. Okay. So, or let's say... You are in a tight squeeze and you work for these gig apps for six months, right? And then you deleted the app. There is no, not even banking account attached. Everything is gone, right? Well, you should get that money too, because they're not going to, by the way, call you and say, oh, by the way, can you reactivate? So put your bank account in there so we can send you the money that you deserve. They're not going to do that either. So now it may not be as much money, right, as... The, the 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 active drivers are going to get but a lot of people fell through the cracks and we know tens if not well not thousands but tens of thousands of people over those 17 months that this was just ignored deserve to get paid and, and, the, and we're the, definitely going to go after that to get them paid i mean we're, we're going to do that so. that's right and this is where again coming back to this information these these companies obfuscate even who their drivers are right they have it they separate from the from the labor that does their delivery function so greatly that they don't even have the ride the drivers recorded from a from a doordash standpoint they're not even recorded in the company logs for uber yeah. there's safety and things that go around uh, taking human beings in a car that are not in a in a last mile delivery yeah. purview uh where where you're just taking packages from from a to b but as sergio said uh those last mile delivery people may may actually stand to gain the most from from this backlog because of, just because of the the dynamics of of the market yeah i mean i i think everybody should get a penny should get a penny out of these companies because it's not their money They've it's been not sitting on this money they've been say they're basically all gig workers who watch this now or later whenever you guys gave these companies an interest-free loan for 17 and a half months. Right. And so we're talking and, about... And lastly, well, one last thing, Jeff, is yeah. that they have been, and we know what has happened into interest rates in the last 17 months. They've gone up quite a bit. This five, six, seven, eight, who knows, billions of dollars from the start of 2020 that they collected on each single trip. That's a lot of change. And they collected, all, and did they invest that money? Did they get a return on that money? Did they lose the money? Was it just in U.S. Treasury bills collecting 2%? Because 2% and $7 billion over three and a half years is a lot of money. Right. So and so I'm like, um, let's let's see. Let's see. We, where we, 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 the fact is, you know, we don't know where it is, but it is somewhere. Where, it's somewhere. Where, where should it be? If, if any know. funds that are like that, that are collected in a tax, should be collected uh, by the state treasurer and kept in a fund that is separate. No, no, no. It's not It's not a tax. This is not a tax. This is just a line item that's or, or, I'm that sorry. Basically... Any, any, any line item associated should be collected by the, by the taxing authority. Uh, and it, there should be rules around when you're collecting other people's money, what kind of account that could be held in and what you can do with that money. That's not just free money generally to put in your bank account and do whatever you wish. Well, uh, that's with, what I think that's what happened because on the on clearly it says this was paid directly to Uber, directly. Right. And that, that's the quote, right? So Uber collected that. The second that trip ended or the delivery ended, Uber right. had that 75 cents. It's somewhere, it's somewhere, somewhere. It's it somewhere. somewhere. And the law, we read the law afterwards and it's it nowhere in the law. Nowhere. It says that Prop 22, we read, I don't know how many times I read the Prop 22 last two weeks. It says nowhere 
that there is this escrow account, there is this this other account, there is this this whatever account, or California driver benefits account at Bank of America, whatever it is. I don't right. even know. Right. Doesn't matter. It doesn't say, and it doesn't say anywhere, anywhere right. in the law that we have to report. We have to have a yearly audit by a big five accounting firm. We have to have an audit by the California Treasurer's Office. We have to because we're collecting benefits for you. And we're paying benefits to you according to the law. Well, when if you're just a regular corporation, right? And when they pay for your health care or when they pay for your social security taxes and other things, there are line items in their books. Well, this is what we're contributing for this person's health care. This is what we're doing. This is what we're paying. This is how much they're contributing. Nothing in the law that says somebody is in charge. No, <laughs> and we know that because. Because the reimbursement checks have becoming have been coming directly from the individual companies. They're not coming yeah. from a pooled fund of hey, here's your no. California, here's your California uh, benefits rebate. This is coming from individual companies, which tells you that each of them just socked away this cash and didn't worry about it. So this is one of those things you can ask yourself: Is this a glitch or is this a feature no, no, no. of the There's law? No I don't There's think no this is a glitch. I think some really great lawyers wrote a law. Yeah. that left so many loopholes that they wouldn't cheese. have to deal with it for a while. Swiss cheese. Yeah. That's just, Swiss cheese. I go, I go like, um, I, I, I'm, I'm look, I, I'm for fairness, right? I'm a capitalist. Don't get me wrong people. But at some point, fairness has to come into play. And when you're talking billions of dollars, we're not talking like chump change here, billions of dollars. And while they're complaining, they all are that, oh, we're not making any money. Mm. Unit economics are bad. We're not making money. We're we're doing the most trips we've ever done in our lives between DoorDash and Uber, but we're still mm -hmm. losing money. Right. So was any of that money funneled here to make the earnings look better? Because these are public companies. And I'm going like, I'm a Wall Street guy. I go, I, I, I mean, if I'm collecting five, six billion dollars since 2020, then I'm sure there'll be a line item somewhere that says, oh, by the way. <laughs> You know, we're pocketing this much money because we're only paying out 10% of what we're collecting from you. Uh, also, it doesn't say like, you know what, it, where they collect the 75 cents on each chip from you? Because this percentage of this is going to the driver. I'm like, no, it, we're just collecting. Okay, collect, no problem. Where, where, where is it? <laughs> right. right. So there's the next shoe to, to, to drop, hopefully. And, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm all for the driver. I'm a driver's advocate. And 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 now I have a platform with megaphone attached to it, which is mm -hmm. called people who trust me in mainstream media and whatever not. And I'm going to use it. I mean, I'm not ashamed to say it. Very I'm exciting it to amplify my voice and to amplify all these drivers' voices. And uh, I think, I mean, last thing I will say is this: I think an accounting of all of Prop Twenty Two from the first day is justified. Yeah, I think uh, I think California did us all a solid on this one. I think we're going to learn more about the gig econ gig economy companies than we've than we've learned in a long time. Yeah. Number one. So, so Sergio, as we wrap up, because this has been a great telling of this story, and I hope people enjoy the the detail that we're going into. Because I wanted to let Sergio tell as much of it as as possible within a podcast. So I, I want to ask you, this is a question I, I ask myself and ask my audience and ask anyone. It, if this, this gig economy was constructed for specific purposes to change the way labor usage is calculated, to change the way corporations function, do you believe that the gig economy in the form of DoorDash last mile delivery, Uber Eats last mile delivery, uh, rideshare, do you believe that, that the gig economy is a legitimate uh, corporate design? Or do you believe that these are giant scams uh, couched under a corporate banner and we just are starting to uncover the layers of the onion which which do you think that is uh, i i think it's 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 you know a little bit of both of what you said on um, initially right because th there's a massive push in the country forget just the doordash driver you know major companies right are, are 
trying to go to this model, right? Google's and Microsoft's and that's what my, my concern is. My concern is for my kids saying that one day they get educated, they get hired somewhere and the Google is going to tell them, oh, you're an independent contractor. Uh, you have no rights here. We're that's right. That's, that's right. My concern, okay. Now, overall, it, it, I, is it a complete scam? I, is it a Ponzi scheme? You know, a lot of people call these things that, okay, I'm not going to, I've heard it. I don't think it's that, but I think the direction that it's going. And again, we have to take this. It's only a 10-year-old industry, okay? This is not like we talk about Uber, Lyft, DoorDash as they've been exist in existence since GE no. has been around. No. They're, ba they're babies. This is 10 years. And adjustments have been made, but at every turn, the fact that these companies, just like, you know, in Minnesota and, 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 and Colorado, they lobby so hard against certain human rights and employee rights tells me something is wrong with this picture here. This is, you know, you wouldn't push that hard against something that people are asking for, okay? That's right. So, you know, that's where, that's where I, you know, that's where I think things are. You don't, you don't need former White House, uh, former White House advisors to sell popsicles and ice cream cones. You, yeah. you just don't. Uh, and and so I think what we have here, and again, congratulations, Sergio, and I hope you'll come back and and give us uh, phase two of this story in a few weeks. Uh, we'll certainly we're actually we're actually breaking news. I'll break this here. Okay, week, I'll give it to us next. Okay, next week, another wonderful LA Times journalist, Swana Hussein, who is as probably good as Brian, um, well known LA Times journalist. We. We sent her a package about a month and a half ago. She's been working on this for a month and a half. Now, this is directly related to a last mile delivery company. Now, you guys take a guess who it may be. I'm not going to give that. Mm -hmm. But that's coming out next week. And it's about, as an independent contractor, can you deactivate me for not accepting enough orders? That's all I'm going to say. So. Good. Yeah, there's there's a lot of injustice. The, the I, as I say for the gig economy, the only rule is there are no rules. Well, there are. It seems like it because we, we're <laughs> thinking now. We're thinking now. If you can deactivate me for not accepting trash orders, what's it going to be that DoorDash says? Oh, they're doing it. But I'm just going to deactivate you now because you didn't accept the two dollar five mile order as an independent contractor. Is that even legal? You know, right. I'm an independent contractor. I can decline like a thousand in a row without repercussion because that's what a two independent contractor will do is if I'm an air conditioning guy and I, and I'm not accepting offers, nobody's going to fire me. <laughs> right. I don't think you can fire me for not accepting orders, but so that's, that's another story that's coming. And, up. and not accepting orders. I always want to know with deceptive and omitted information. Yeah. Oh, in yeah, them, right. So they're, they're playing, they're playing this game with labor from start to finish. They're playing this game with consumers. They're playing this game with governments um, maybe this is a game. Well, it could be. It, you know, I, look, I, I, <laughs> I love your word, uh, labor laundering, right? I always use it. I like your La word. Labor, labor, labor laundering. laundering is a term I coined and that, that Sergio. And, and, you know, I borrowed it from you. And then, and, and you know, um, you call it a simulation. Um, when I'm doing work, actually, it almost nowadays, I go like, really? I go, How is this? <laughs> this is not even possible. What just happened? Right. Because no. I'm reasonably intelligent. I mean, I'm not the smartest man on the planet, but I kind of know what's happening up here. And I go like, this is this, is, this doesn't look right. <laughs> but anyway, so look, you know, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for you know allowing me to the time to tell the story. Um, and um, more to come. <laughs> yeah. Hey, my pleasure. Um, and thank you so much, Sergio. Uh, thank you so much to the rideshare guy. That generally, uh, as a rule is live on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. Pacific time, uh, Pacific daylight time right now. I've been a guest on that show. Hope I will be again. Thank you so much, Sergio, for being on episode 15 of the Full Dash Closure audiobook and podcast. And good luck in taking these gig economy uh, companies to task. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. Thank you for having me.